Great. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for coming today. My name is Darcy Dugan. I'm with the Alaska Ocean Observing System and the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network. And I'm joining today from the traditional homeland of the Denaina people where I live in Anchorage. Um, and I want to introduce session three of this four part series hosted by the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network. Um, and the network started in 2016 with the goal of trying to expand our understanding of ocean acidification, both the processes and the consequences, um, and also look into adaptation and mitigation options. And one of the primary objectives of the network is to bring together experts on what we know so far about ocean acidification in Alaska um, with the people to whom those impacts matter. Um, and today's session, session three, will build on the first two sessions. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, um, but to recap, the first session was on regional conditions. So it was looking at what do we know about the current status of waters um, around Alaska and how they're expected to change. And the second part was looking at species response part one um, with a focus on mariculture and subsistence species. And today is species response part two. Um, and we'll be looking at what ocean acidification means for commercial species. Uh, the structure is going to be similar to the last two sessions. We'll start with three speakers who will be sharing the latest science on crab, brownfish, and salmon. Um, those are the species we know most about in Alaska right now. Um, and I should mention there's also a lot of other commercial species um, that haven't been studied yet. And in a second, I'll put a link um, in the chat to a poster of um, all of the Alaska species that have been studied in some capacity about their response to ocean acidification. Um, and also an annotated bibliography that, that lists out what those studies looked at and what they found. Um, after the presentations, we're gonna divide into breakout groups based on species. And this will be an opportunity to ask additional questions um, about what we heard during the presentation and also explore ways to better collaborate and communicate on these topics. Um, so before we move into that, I first wanna thank the executive committee of the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network who have put in um, a lot of thought and organization and how to structure these sessions. And I think Molly's gonna put their names in the chat. Uh, and then I'll introduce Molly Mayo with the Meridian Institute who is our facilitator for the series. Um, she has been a facilitator and mediator focusing on natural resource management and policy issues for over 25 years. And she is gonna line out um, how today is gonna work. So I'll hand it off to Molly. Thanks, Darcy, and, and it's terrific to see some familiar names, um, some return participants, and also some new names. Welcome to everyone uh, to uh, help us manage some of the noise, especially as more people are joining us and such. Please make sure you mute, keep your, uh, your audio muted, and um, we are, would love to make sure that everyone is getting to know each other a little bit as we uh, continue this discussion series. So if you have a chance, please rename yourself with not just your name, but also your organization. You can do that by right-clicking on your window, selecting rename, and then enter some additional information to share that with everyone else. Um, we, we're not going to do full introductions with the entire group just for time's sake, but we are going to this time do a little bit longer introductions in the breakout rooms. So everyone can look forward to at least getting to know those that are in your breakout group when we move over to those smaller group discussions in the second half of, of the, the session. Um, as Darcy explained, this is a two hour agenda overall. The first hour, we're gonna be hearing from some of our most prominent experts in the field on um, some of the impacts on the commercial species that we know the most about, as she already explained. Um, but we also want to be able to create an opportunity to share across some of the wide range of expertise within the group. So especially during the second half of the session, we really encourage all of you to participate actively. We've been learning a lot as we've been doing these sessions. We've given um, a couple of different options for how you can participate. We will again use a mural board for those of you who participated in one of the, pre uh, the previous sessions. But we also want to get some back and forth among experts in, in the uh, the breakout room. So please be prepared to both write ideas on the whiteboard, share some of your thinking, and also um, provide some additional uh, insight into the work that you are doing as, as experts when we get to the second half of the session in the second hour. 
So for now, um, I would like to, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce three excellent guest speakers who are going to be sharing an overview for us of the science that is available right now to inform our understanding of what ocean acidi acidification means for commercially harvested species. Um, as Darcy said, we're focusing on three that we know the most about, which I think is a nice signal to be able to recognize that we don't, we have limits to our understanding. Um, we, uh, we want to be able to talk about what we don't know and where we want to focus on learning more. So that's another um, topic that we can be delving into a little bit more in the, um, in the breakout sessions. To kick off the presentations, we are welcoming Chris Long, who got his PhD at the College of William and Mary, studying the effects of low dissolved oxygen on Chesapeake Bay species and ecosystems. And after two year, a two-year postdoctoral fellowship with the Smithsonian, studying predator-prey relationships and blue crab habitat, he moved to Kodiak. There he's been working with the National Marine Fisheries Service, and he now researches the biology and ecology of commercial Alaskan crab species with a strong focus on the impacts and effects of ocean acidification. So Chris, welcome. It's terrific to have you here and to kick off uh, our, our um, three speakers. Um, feel free to share your slides. All right, thank you, Molly. All right, give me a second and I will share. And now we gotta all see that. There we go. Get going. All right. Well, thank you all for being here today. My name um, is Chris Long, uh, and I am working in Kodiak and been working with uh, with CO2 and crabs for, for about the last 12 years now. So um, excited to share with you what we've been learning over all that time. So um, just this is just a slide to, to uh, um, kind of get you oriented to what ocean acidification is. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, um, but this is a graph um, from the PMEL carbon program um, that I think really does a nice job of illustrating what's going on. So this is a time series. Um, it's showing um, the partial pressure of CO2, both in the atmosphere and the seawater. So this left-hand axis here is, is uh, how much CO2 is there. The red line is atmosphere, and the green line here is the seawater um, in the ocean off, off of Hawaii. These are all taken in Hawaii, by the way. Um, and then the blue line here and the, the right-hand axis is showing the pH um, of the ocean water as well. So um, what you can see, this is a familiar curve um, as, uh, as the Industrial Revolution kicked off in the late 1800s, we started burning lots and lots of fossil fuels. And that has caused this increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. So you can see since the 1950s, we've gone up from you know, just over 300 to um, now we're, we're just over 400 um, parts per million um, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, this CO2 um, dissolves in the, in, in the ocean as well. So the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, um, the more of that is going to dissolve down into the water. Um, and so the, it shouldn't be a surprise here to see that the PCO2 here in the ocean, the green curve here, has been tracking um, the atmospheric PCO2 as well. So it's going up, it's going up at a, almost exactly the same rate. Um, it's a little bit below the atmospheric CO2. That's because there's lots of, in the surface waters of the ocean, there's lots of um, uh, organisms that take that up and use it to make food um, through photosynthesis. Um, and and a, a little bit of noise in there as well, of course, you can see it goes up and down. Um, there's a lot of interannual variability. Um, but the overall trend is exactly the same as the atmosphere. Um, and uh, it's, it's going up over time. Now, um, CO2 is, uh, is, when it dissolves in water, it actually doesn't just dissolve in water the way oxygen does and a lot of the other gases do. It actually chemically reacts with water. And when it does that, when you have one CO2 molecule, it combines with one H2O molecule, one water molecule, and it makes carbonic acid. Um, and then um, that goes on then. Now you've created an acid in the water and that affects the pH of the water. And um, so that's what the blue line here is showing is that as the CO2 in the ocean has been going up, the pH of the ocean has been slowly going down. Um, and on average in surface waters in the ocean, we've seen about a 0.1 
um, pH reduction since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution here. Um, and so overall, I mean, the take home from this, it's a really, it's really, really simple science. It's just that the carbon dioxide goes up in the air, that leads to it going up in the ocean, and that leads to a decrease of the pH in the ocean. And this then leads us to the question of, well, um, is that going to affect things that we care about in the ocean? And how is that going to affect things that we care about in the ocean? And so um, since um, uh, even before I showed up in Kodiak in, in late 2009, we've been running experiments looking at um, the effects uh, of ocean acidification. And I'm part of a shellfish assessment program here at um, Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And uh, so we've been focusing in on the uh, crab species um, in Bering Sea. Um, this is a, a picture of one of our setups here. I think um, in the gray tubs, we had ovigerous um, egg-bearing um, female tanner crabs. And then in these, uh, these little totes over here, we'll see some close-ups later on of these, these crab, but we had juvenile crabs, um, blue king crabs inside of each of those ones in there. Um, and this is a typical setup that we have um, in the laboratory. We, we basically take whatever life history stage that we're interested in, we expose it um, to different pHs of water, um, and, uh, and then we look and see what effects that has on the, the organism. Um, now, crabs are, are a long-lived species um, in uh, here, especially here, at least Alaska crabs are long-lived species, and uh, they've got actually fairly complex um, life history stages. And so I want to walk through that with you right now, um, just so you get an idea of some of, as we talk through the different effects, um, what we're talking about. Um, so every crab um, in the ocean started off as an egg, um, and inside of each, so this is a, a female here, and this is the egg clutch that she bears underneath her abdominal um, flap here under her apron. Um, and if you zoom in on these individual eggs, inside each of them is an embryonic crab. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a late stage red king crab embryos that I've got pictured here. Um, they're kind of cute anyway, or at least I'm, I'm biased. It's like saying your own kids are cute, right? <laughs> Um, and now we've got, uh, these guys hatch. Um, they, they're carried under the female um, aprons here for about a year. Um, then they hatch out into larvae. These guys look like little shrimp and they actually live up in the water column. So unlike the adults who live on the bottom, um, these guys are actually swimming up um, in the water. Now they go through um, a series of molts for red and king crab. Um, it's four uh, zoeal stages here and one glockothoe stage, which is the next one I've got pictured. Um, for tanner and snow crabs, there's only two zoeal and then a megalope, which is similar to this. Um, these, uh, the, the megalope stage um, or the glockothoe stage, depending on the species, um, they uh, spend time looking for good habitat to settle in. Um, and when they find it, they molt to um, the first juvenile stage on the bottom. And it, from this point on, they're gonna be benthic, that is bottom dwelling animals. Um, little crabs eventually grow into big crabs and big crabs, um, birds and bees come along and then they make more little crabs and this whole cycle repeats, hopefully. Um, and for crabs, this is about a seven to nine year cycle um, to, to complete this one. Um, it depends on the species and, uh, and of course, on things like temperature on the wild as well, um, but it takes a while for them to go through all of this. Um, and one of the points that I want to make is that um, on this is because you've got this complex life history um, cycle and because each of, these, um, each of these parts of the cycle here, each of these, these life history stages, um, live in, in a slightly different habitat. You know, the, the embryos are in the abdominal flap of the female, which is, is a fairly unique environment. Um, the, the larvae are up in the water column up near the surface, which is completely different um, from, the, from living on the bottom, which is what the juveniles and the, uh, and the adults live in. Um, and each of these has, um, uh, we, we know this from studying other stressors in, in other species, is that uh, different life, life history stages can have different sensitivities to environmental stressors, such as um, ocean acidification. And so, um, and, and also because the cycle is so long, we, uh, we tend to grab one of these and look at just embryos or just larvae um, just to make kind of manage manageable bite-sized chunks um, in looking at them. 
So I'm going to be walking you through a, a series of slides, um, some of the some data from uh, of the, some some individual experiments, and then also some summary slides for each of the species, just to give you an idea of what we know about these species so far. So. One of the first things is that we see very frequently that ocean acidification reduces crab survival. Um, this is from an experiment we did looking at juvenile red king crab. So this is a little, little baby red king crab up on the top here and juvenile tanner crab. This is this bottom right, one right here. Um, and a lot of the slides are gonna be fairly similar. So along this um, bottom axis here, we have the time in days. Um, so this experiment was run um, for about 200 days. And we held both red king crabs and tanner crabs at three different pHs. So a control or ambient pH is just what the surface ocean is right now, which is about a pH of 8 to 8.1. It varies over the course of a year. Um, a second pH we have here um, is about 7.8. This is what is um, predicted for, for global ocean average in the surface um, within about the next 50 to 70 years. Um, so this is kind of a near term where we're headed. And then the, the lowest pH 7.5 is about a century after that. So sometime mid next century to late next century, we're expecting to have average ocean conditions at 7.5. Um, but that um, uh, uh, important point I want to make now is though that, that crabs don't live in the surface ocean. We know a lot about the surface ocean. We know a lot less about what's happening on the bottom of the ocean. And so, um, but what we do know from these crab habitats is that a 7.5 may seem low, um, but that's actually a pH that seasonally um, Bristol Bay um, and Bering Sea get to in the middle of the summer um, towards the late summer. This is kind of the lowest the pH swings down to in their habitats already. So while it, we may be a long time from this being average, um, this, is, this is not outside of what these crabs are actually experiencing um, today. Um, so going back to the graphs, we've got the two species here, red king crab and tanner crab, and each of these plots goes from 100% survival. So at the beginning of the experiment, of course, all the crabs were alive, um, and then down to 0% survival. And what you can see is that for both species, as you run over time, um, the, you know, some of the crabs die um, in the control. Um, a lot more die, it's pH of 7.8, and, and a whole lot more die at 7.5. Um, and that's one thing to look at um, here, that the pattern is the same between the two species. But um, an, an important thing to note is that there's a big difference between these two species too. Um, red king crab are, um, appear a whole lot more sensitive to ocean acidification than do tanner crab. So while it's not good for either species, um, you can see that there's uh, variation um, among the species here. It also reduces growth. Um, so this is um, the same experiment. Um, and this is just looking at how those crabs grew over the course of um, time. Um, I'm only showing the control in the pH 7.8 because as you probably noticed in the previous slide, all of the juveniles um, in 7.5 died. Um, and so they, we, we didn't get any growth data from those guys for some reason. Um, the top graph here um, is showing the carapace length. So that's um, how, how big the crab is um, just in terms of linear me measurements. And then the bottom one is the, the wet mass or the weight of the crab right here. And in, in both terms right here, you can see that, uh, that the controls are in these solid dots um, and the, the trend is in the lines here. Um, and the control crabs grow a lot faster over time than do the pH 7.8s. Um, you get a significant decrease um, in mass um, in particular. They're about half the size after the course of this 200-day experiment here. And um, of course, ocean acidification is not the only thing that's changing. Um, we also see uh, the, that where temperatures are changing as well. And so we've, we've started to do experiments where we combine ocean acidification with pH. And this is an experiment where we did three different temperatures and two different pHs. So again, this was just ambient and 7.8. And this is just juvenile red king crab again. Um, so in this one, we had six different treatments, but I want to just highlight um, the uh, three important ones here to kind of make the point I want to make from this graph. 
Um, this is the same, similar to two slides ago where I've got percent survival here on the um, y-axis and time experimental day over the, over the um, x-axis here. And again, you can see we, we get fairly good survival um, in just kind of normal ambient um, conditions right here. If you reduce the pH, um, unsurprisingly, just like we saw in the last experiment, you get a reduction in um, survival. But if you reduce the uh, pH and increase the temperature at the same time, then the survival goes way down. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a, a um, interactive effect. Um, and it, it, this shouldn't be too surprising. You know, it's we're we're the same as as uh, as human beings. You know, if we're stressed out by one thing, we can usually we can often manage it. But once you start throwing a second or third stressor at us, um, all of a sudden things start to fall apart pretty quickly here. Um, and that's what's just happening physiologically um, for these crabs. So that was just to give you kind of examples of what it looks like, um, uh, what you know, kinds of experiments and what the data looks like as we're running them. Um, what I'm going to do now is kind of run through um, a, a bigger picture of uh, each individual species so you can get an idea of which life history stages we've studied um, and, which, uh, uh, and, and which ones are most affected. So we're going to start with red king crab. Um, that's what I've showed you the most of so far. Um, looking at embryos, at least in the late um, development, we don't see an effect on mortality of these ones or hatching. Um, some small differences in development, though, so um, differences in how quickly the embryos were growing, basically, on that. Um, with larvae, we saw a slight increase in mortality, but they seem to be relatively robust um, uh, in the change of, uh, with changing pHs. Um, juveniles have really been where we've seen um, a, a lot of effects. So uh, as I showed you, we see a decrease uh, growth, an increase in mortality, um, and decrease in condition index. This is kind of like a, a BMI for crabs. Um, the hardness of their exoskeleton goes down. Um, and as I showed you, these are temperature dependent. So uh, as you add temperature to it, you get kind of what we call a synergistic response, um, where it's, it's worse than either stress or by itself. Adults seem to be a little bit um, uh, more robust. Um, we see an, actually an increase in calcium content in their shells, um, but, and we also see some altered gene expressions, but, uh, but they seem to be better able to deal with low pH than the juveniles. With blue crim crab, we've just looked at juveniles. Um, and uh, um, uh, at, up to this point, we've seen, similar to red king crab, a decrease in growth, increase in mortality. Um, we see an increase in respiration rate, which means they're, they're breathing harder, using more um, oxygen. And like red king crab, we also see a decrease in hardness in their shells here. Um, but uh, one of the things there, while, while we see these effects, blue king crabs seem to be, similar to tanner crab, a little bit more resilient than red king crab. With golden king crab, um, we've done experiments looking at juveniles. And with them, again, we saw a decrease in growth and increase in mortality, um, just like the reds and blues. With adults, um, we've done some experiments looking at how it affects their exoskeleton, how it affects their hemolymph, which is just a fancy word for, for crab blood, um, their chemistry, and then their immune response. Um, but those are, those are still, uh, uh, we need to still do the analysis on those ones before we can get going, or before I can present them. Tanner crab is another one we've looked at a lot. Um, embryos, we saw actually a huge increase in mortality under decreased pH conditions. Um, and when, it, when I say huge, it was like 80 uh, or 70 percent um, of the embryos either didn't hatch or they died right um, after hatching, the, the larvae did. Um, in contrast, um, we see a small increase in mortality um, and a decrease in calcium content, but the larvae seem to be much more resilient compared to the embryos and compared to the juveniles, where there's decreasing growth, increased mortality, and a decrease in calcification in the shells there. Um, with the adults, um, we see um, their immune system seems to, fun uh, to, to go down. Um, they've got uh, higher mortality of their white blood cell or the crab equivalent of white blood cells. Um, we see a decrease in hardness, and um, we're currently um, got some uh, interesting gene ex uh, expression um, stuff in, uh, in uh, analysis phase right here. So we're excited to, to look at that. 
Um, I really wanted to draw a uh, uh, attention to this particular slide right here because it actually is a it's a very visual uh, picture of what's going on or what can go on with these guys. So this is this is adult uh, tanner crabs. Um, these were uh, mature females, and uh, we held them at two different p or three different pHs um, for two years. And then at the end of that, we sacrificed the crabs and we took a, a, a bit of their carapace, that's the upper shell part right here, and we looked at the inside of that. Um, and the crabs actually calcify from the inside of their bodies, so that's an important place to look. We also looked at their claws, um, and so this is that lower movable, or the upper, sorry, movable thumb of the claw. And um, these, I really want to draw your attention to these white, um, they're called denticles, um, but they're the tooth-like things on here. Um, and after two years, the, the ambient crabs, you can see the inside of the carapace is nice, white, shiny. It, it looks hard. You can see that where it's been cut, it, it's kind of uh, chipped away, um, like you would expect from a hard mineral. Um, and the, in, on the claws, you've got these nice, you know, good teeth. They, it looks relatively healthy. You've got good, good bumps right there. Um, they're, they'll be going to be able to crush their prey and defend themselves. But when you look at this 7.5 now, all of a sudden you've got dissolution um, in these shells. You can see there's not as much chipping along the edge. That's because the, the mineral content is way down. And um, on the claws, like all those teeth, all those denticles have, have just eroded away. Um, so they're not there anymore. Oh, crabs seem to be a, uh, uh, a much um, kind of a bright sh shining star when it comes to this. Um, we, with embryos and larvae, we saw no effects on them pretty much on anything we've measured so far. Um, we've, we're currently working on juveniles. Um, the, the, my, you know, just kind of glancing at the containers is that uh, we don't see an increase in mortality, but there may be an increase in, in growth, um, though, of course, that's not been analyzed yet. And with the adults, we did not see the similar effect that in the tanner crabs where there wasn't an effect on the shell hardness. Just to kind of um, bring it all together, this is, this is a, a, a plot um, here where we've got the different species, different life history stages, the different things that we've measured over the years. Um, and basically red means it was worse for the crab, yellow means there was no change, and green means it was, it was better. Um, when you put them in low pH. And the big takeaway from this right here is that, um, is that pH, is, uh, ocean acidification is really not good for crabs. Um, overall crabby observations though, reds and tanners seem to be more sensitive to ocean acidification than snows and blue king crab. Um, we're not sure why. Um, from a life history perspective, larvae are pretty resilient to resistant to ocean acidification, and embryos seem to be um, to in some of the species as well fairly resistant. Um, juveniles seem to be the most sensitive across all the life history stages, but ooh, there's a lot of differences among species, and there's some indication that uh, some of these species may be able to adapt um, over time. So we've got a lot of stuff that we've got planned and in progress. A lot of what we're looking at is we're starting to look a lot more at snow crab because they're, they're really important species that we haven't worked with as lot just because they're, they're trickier to work with because of the temperature requirements. They, they like it cold. Um, but a lot of what we're planning and working on is trying to figure out what the adaptive capacity for these guys are. Um, what is the, what's the mechanisms by which they respond to ocean acidification and why, for example, are snow crabs so resilient while tanner crabs are not, um, uh, even though they're very, very similar species. And I think that is it for my time. Um, this was uh, mostly funded here by the Ocean Acidification Program at NOAA. Um, and through the North Pacific Research Board. Um, and we had dozens and dozens of people that I can't, don't have space to list on um, who helped with these many, many experiments over the last 12 years. So thank you very much. And I will Thank you, stop Chris. There. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris, uh, for a thorough uh, presentation. And so a reminder, especially for an, and or um, an update for those who have just joined, we will have an opportunity to go into questions during the breakout rooms. But for now, during the plenary, we're going to move on through. I will invite anyone who wants to share questions to do so in the chat, and we will do our best to carry those into the breakout room. So if you have questions for Chris, feel free to, to document those and we'll take note.
But in the meantime, I'm gonna quickly move on to Tom in the interest of time. Thomas Hurst is a research fisheries biologist with NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, Alaska Fisheries Science Center in the Fisheries Behavioral Ecology Program located at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Center, Science Center in Newport, or um, Oregon. Much of Tom's work focuses on the influence of temperature variation on the physiolo physiolo physiology and ecology of fish um, of fishes, including behavior, habitat selection, growth energetics, and larval ecology. New areas of research include the potential impacts of ocean acidification on fishes of the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. His research is focused on species of commercial importance in Alaska, including walleye pollock, Pacific cod, northern rock sole, and Pacific halibut. Welcome, Tom, and thank you for being our next presenter. Great, thanks Molly, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. <clears throat> and just confirm uh, that you can see that. That looks great, thanks Tom. Great, thank you. Um, so um, a lot of what I'm gonna say um, will have some, a lot of parallels to the presentation that Chris just presented about crabs, although of course I'm gonna talk about fishes and uh, ground fishes in particular in this talk. Um, Overall, our goal <clears throat> is to understand the impacts of ocean acidification on Alaska marine species, marine ground fishes, and then to try to forecast the effects, those effects on industries and communities to um, make sure the stakeholders can plan appropriately. This again, like Chris's work is focused on laboratory experimentation, exposing animals to environments um, that describe their physiological, behavioral, and ecological responses. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we um, think about the effects of ocean acidification on fish. We think about a couple of different areas we want to talk about. So um, a lot of the stuff that Chris just talked about are these direct effects. So these are things that affect the growth and survival or the physiology um, of the animals. Um, there's also the food web effects. So it's, it's even if the uh, an individual species, like Chris mentioned, um, are like snow crab are not affected, productivity of that species can be affected if the things they eat are affected by um, high CO2 or ocean acidification. And then fishes were also really interested in this um, unusual category of effects on sensory, the sensory and behavioral biology of fishes. And that's based on observations that fish exposed to high CO2 um, have alterations in some aspect of their sensory or behavioral biology. And then we want to know how that might impact their foraging or predator avoidance at all. And, those kinds of things. And then all three of these things together, we want to think about how the cumulative effects of those three kinds of effects um, come together to affect the um, potential for population productivity and the, the, the potential future harvest of commercial and subsistence fisheries. <clears throat> so I'm going to run through just some of, the, some of the kinds of examples like Chris did that we've seen in different species. And again, just give a little summary of where we're at and what we've learned so far. Um, so, so the first, um, and this is shown a little bit differently than the way Chris showed his, but um, in one experiment, we saw an effect of ocean acidification on survival in northern rock sole larvae. And so in the graph here, these are CO2 levels going from uh, current ambient variation um, around uh, two, 250 to 400 up to uh, future levels of around 1500. And then these are a categorical mortality rate across a series of experiments that we did. And you can see that <clears throat> the um, mortality rates of the larvae in these experiments went up as the CO2 levels were higher. And so um, this is not just in one experiment, it's like three experiments um, combined to put this data together. But so we see this pattern of higher survival um, at, at current CO2 levels and, and lower survival at the higher CO2 levels that we might expect to see in the future. Um, I'll point out, um, it's interesting at the top here, it says we, we didn't, um, these were, we did similar experiments with the eggs of, the, of northern rock sole, and we didn't see an effect of high CO2 on the hatch rate or the survival of the eggs in that experiment. So this was, in this case, uh, strictly linked to the, the larval stages. <clears throat> Another thing that we have seen more recently is um, the, an effect of OA on the development of walleye pollock. <clears throat> And so in the panel on the right, you can see these are um, microscope images of um, walleye pollock. And in the left two columns, you can see uh, these 
these fish are about eight or nine millimeters long. And here right in the middle of this green arrow is the swim bladder of the fish. And so of course the swim bladder is the air bladder in the body of the fish that helps the fish maintain buoyancy, helps it orient and navigate and move up and down with depth. And so fish are born without this swim bladder. And then at, in Walleye Pollock, at least in this, this is the stage when they form that swim bladder. And what we found was that um, fish that were reared at normal CO2 levels had high rates of inflated swim bladder. And you can see the swim bladder here. Fish that were uh, reared under elevated CO2 levels were often lacking the swim bladder. The swim bladder just never formed uh, and, and never got air filled in these fish. And so <clears throat> we don't really know what kind of effect that might have on them in the long run. Um, <clears throat> but clearly there's some sort of interference with a normal aspect of development in these larvae. Now it's interesting that in that same experiment, the figure over on the left shows the length of the fish in the experiment at the ambient and high CO2 levels. And it's interesting to point out that the high CO2 levels were, um, were basically the same size as the fish in the, in the ambient CO2 levels. There was, there was no effect uh, on the growth rates of the animals in our experiment. And this is something that we had seen before similarly. Um, so, but even though they were the same size, the ones that were reared at the high CO2 levels were missing this critical swim bladder. And so even though, our, our, so our concern about that is that even though we didn't see an effect, if this were effect to occur in nature, that there might be negative consequences of this effect later on in life. Or perhaps even in the wild, um, if this effect was occurring, the fish would be not able to navigate as well, wouldn't be able to forage as well, um, which wouldn't have been a problem in the lab. Um, because we give them plenty of food and there's no predators around. Um, so, um, by the way, so this is another kind of effect that we have seen in some fish species. And other fish species have seen similar, um, but a, a variety of different kind of developmental abnormalities associated with rearing at high CO2 levels. <clears throat> um, the last sort of categorical thing I'll mention is um, this effect of OA uh, acidification on behavior. And this is an example from Pacific cod larvae. Um, and again, a um, number of studies have shown that um, the exposure to high CO2 alters. Um, and it's sometimes hard to tell whether it's an aspect of the sensory biology of the animal or, or just the behavioral response um, of animals. But we see it across different species. And, and in this experiment, what we did was we exposed the fish to a, a gradient of light in a small aquaria in a test chamber and then looked at how quickly the fish moved in response to the light. So we know that while Pollock larvae, or excuse me, uh, Pacific cod larvae uh, are attracted to light. Um, and so we wanted to look at how they responded and if, whether, if, whether ocean acidification exposure altered that behavioral, behavioral response. And so you can see here, so we put them in the tank with no light gradient. And then this bar shows when over time, when we impose the light gradient, and you can see all the fish started moving over toward the bright side of the tank and they started accumulating. And then when they got over toward the bright side of the tank, then we reversed the gradient and made the place where they were the dark side now and the opposite side, the bright side. And then the fish started moving slowly you know, over the next few minutes uh, to the other side of the tank. And, and the interesting thing is actually that these open boxes are the ambient fish and these filled in boxes are the fish at higher CO2 levels. And so interestingly, for some reason, the high CO2 exposure caused the fish to be um, more rapidly responsive. And, and so I think this is a kind of phenomenon that is sort of categorized in other fishes as a sort of high reactivity. So the fishes um, re are more reactive to some uh, aspects of the environment um, or, or the acidification alters how they, how they respond to aspects of the environment. So um, exactly how this plays out uh, and will play out in the production of cod in the future is a little bit daunting, um, but, it's, but it's one of the pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to fit together. <clears throat> and so I said, so as I mentioned, those are just a few examples of the kinds of things that we look for and the kinds of things that we've seen. And, and again, so similar to Chris, here's a, a little snapshot summary of what we've seen across the experiments that we've done so far. Um, for the most part, we have found that, uh, you know, fortunately, walleye pollock seems to be the least affected. Um, while we did see that effect on the swim bladder, we haven't seen effects in either um, hatching or um, larval growth rates. 
Um, and we've done some work on juveniles and juveniles um, in most fishes are resilient to CO2 in general. Um, Northern rock so we have seen some negative effects um, that I pointed to the reduced effect of um, hatch size at high CO2 um, and some reduced growth and um, condition factor. Um, but again, we saw that in the larvae, but not in the eggs. And then in Pacific cod, we saw that behavior re behavioral response that I was just describing. Um, and we also saw an interesting growth response where during the first two weeks after hatching, growth was reduced at high CO2, but then it actually increased um, later on after that. So um, there's a, a lot of different kinds of effects that we're seeing and we're trying to piece that all together. So just a sort of quick summary, um, the um, fishes appear more sensitive at the egg and larval stage. Um, that's a little bit different than the what Chris was describing with crabs, where he finds that the eggs especially might be um, uh, less sensitive often, and it's the juvenile stages of crabs that tend to be maybe more sensitive. Um, however, like uh, Chris's work with the crab species, there's a lot of variation among species um, in what, um, how sensitive they are and exactly what kinds of responses they exhibit under high CO2. And then so looking forward, um, the research needs that are still out there, um, as I mentioned, you know, a big aspect is understanding how uh, acidification is going to affect other components of the food web and then how that would affect the productivity of these commercial species. Chris talked about um, interactions with other stressors, um, in particular temperature changes as well. Um, and I just walked across the hall from an, the laboratory where we're doing an ex experiment on the effects of temperature and CO2 levels together on um, larval and, and egg Pacific cod. Um, and then the last thing is we want to figure out how we can um, provide this information, but also um, describe the potential impacts to fishery production uh, based on these responses. And I'm just going to give two really quick examples of that kind of work. And so um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here and um, because it's um, a very complicated uh, story, but um, basically we worked on a model to look at rock soul um, futures and sort of the, the main take home point of, or one of the take home points of that work was that even though we saw the negative effects of CO2 on larval survival in this species, we also in other data sets see a positive effect of warming temperatures on the recruitment of northern rock sole. <clears throat> and these are two phenomena that are happening at different time scales. The temperature effect is happening sooner than the OA effect. But at least in the short run, you know, the our models are suggesting that the, uh, that the positive effect of, of nursery ground temperatures on Bering Sea rock sole is more than the negative effect of acidification on their survival. So at least in this model run, it suggests that there was not going to be a big uh, reduction in rock sole. But again, there's still a lot of pieces that we don't know. This model doesn't take into account um, anything about the potential changes in the food of the rock sole and those kinds of things. So um, it's not perfect yet, but it's, we are trying to start building and um, see where we can go with these. And then the last thing I'll mention is that we're performing um, this project called the Regional Vulner Vulnerability Assessment. And that's um, a community centric approach to evaluating the risks from ocean acidification um, across not just ground fishes, but all kinds of species groups, um, including uh, aquaculture and subsistence harvest and some of the things we heard about in the previous session. And this is you know, working with people in the different communities to uh, help them understand and um, predict on their own, based on the science that we have, um, what the likely impacts are gonna be for them and their community and how that'll affect the well-being um, uh, and allow them to help their decision-making at the local and regional level. So um, I will go ahead and stop there and um, thank Maude for the invitation. And uh, again, I'd be happy to answer questions when we go into our breakout sessions. Thanks, Tom. That, that was terrific. Again, second great presentation. And um, as for those who just joined, we are taking questions through the chat. We'll carry those into the small group, the uh, breakout room discussions, and, so that we can delve more deeply into some of these topics in those groups. Uh, our third presenter is Marina Alcantar, and she is a fourth generation Alaskan born in Fairbanks and raised there, uh, where she is also currently studying as a PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in their College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. She's studying the impacts of ocean climate change on marine organisms vital to Alaska's commercial, recreational, and subsistence fisheries, 
And her goal is to establish a bridge between climate change research and the communities and industries that rely on these cornerstone animals. So welcome, Marina, it's great to have you. Um, we can, I'll post your, there we go. Okay. Hey, are, all right, we all set? Let me, you, there we go. Is that good? We're, we're seeing not the present, there you go. Okay. Okay. Now you're all set. Am I unmuted? It's saying I'm not. You, you sound are good. coming in loud and clear. Okay, and excellent. We can see. I'm going to get started. Thanks, everyone. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as Molly said, my name is Marina. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, an experiment that we did looking at the both the direct and indirect effects of ocean acidification on juvenile pink salmon. Um, in Alaska. Uh, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I currently work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Trough Yadaw campus on the lower unceded traditional homelands of the lower Tanana Dene. Um, and I conducted this research as a guest working on the unceded traditional homelands of the Dena'ina and the Aleutic peoples. Um, so to get you into the experiment that we ran, if my slideshow will move, there we go. Um, so we wanted to look at both the direct and indirect effects of ocean acidification on newly osmocompetent juvenile salmon. So salmon have just moved into saltwater, um, and so we wanted to look at both how they would respond directly to increases in PCO2 or to acidification, um, as well as to the loss of a food resource um, as a result of an indirect OA effect. Um, and this was via potentially the loss of pteropods and other zooplankton um, species under acidified conditions. Um, pteropods and other zooplankton have been shown to be negatively affected by acidification. Um, and so in the future, it's predicted that we will actually see smaller populations. And um, these represent a, a very large food resource for pink salmon. And so um, we wanted to look at the interactive effect of uh, of those stressors as well as individually. Um, and so we ran four separate treatments, ambient PCO2 or pH with an ambient food level. And that is our, oh, really slow today, sorry. That is our current condition, um, an ambient PCO2 pH and reduced food level, an elevated PCO2 pH, and then an ambient food level and then an elevated PCO2 reduced food level. And that represented our true predicted future condition. Um, and this image here of all these buckets is our uh, experimental culture setup. So another important part of our experiment was to look at um, not only you know, one response such as growth or, or organismal quality over time, but to really incorporate multiple levels of biological organization. And so we looked at everything from length, growth, conditional index to morphological development. Um, we looked at otolith growth, mineralogy, crystalline structure, and endocrine response, uh, as well as metabolic response. So the first metric I want to walk everyone through is our mortality over the course of the experiment. Um, and this is a figure very similar to what Chris showed you earlier. We have um, day of experiment on the x-axis here, and then our percent of surviving stock on the y-axis. Um, and really what I want to highlight is that over the course of the experiment, we had no mortality until about the third or fourth week of the experiment, uh, at which point we started to see uh, pretty marked uh, decreases in our surviving stock. Um, and so it's this inflection point that I, um, I kind of want you all to keep in the back of your head because I'm going to come back to it in, in just a minute. So the first metric we looked at was conditional index. And this can kind of be thought of as a metric of fish quality. Um, and so what we found was that overall, there was a negative effect of elevated PCO2 on conditional index. And so what that means is that the fish that were reared under elevated PCO2 conditions or in that acidic treatment had a worse conditional index than individuals who were reared under ambient conditions. Um, this relationship was also seen in mass. Um, we found a negative effect of elevated PCO2 on mass, uh, as well as a negative effect of food availability on mass. Um, and so this means that individuals who were uh, 
living in an elevated PCO2 condition weighed less than individuals in an ambient PCO2 condition, and then individuals who were fed less weighed less than individuals who were fed the ambient rate. Uh, in terms of morphometrics, we saw some interesting alterations to these three growth measurements, um, caudal length, abdominal length, and post-anal length. Um, and essentially what we found was that the combination of elevated PCO2 and reduced food availability led to smaller uh, lengths in these body sections in individuals. Um, and so essentially this is just suggesting that that developmental uh, uh, growth of a fish, the morphology over time is being altered uh, as a result of these combined factors. So moving away from overall uh, fish response uh, to more of an internal look, um, we wanted to look at otoliths. And so otoliths are fish ear bones. They're composed of calcium carbonate. Um, and a really important thing to note is that there are multiple types of calcium carbonate. And the two that it can be found in uh, sa salmon, particularly hatchery salmon, are vaterite and aragonite. And so it's important to distinguish between these two for a couple of reasons. The first is that battery is typically found more in hatchery salmon than it is in wild caught salmon. Um, we're still not really sure the cause behind this. And so uh, we wanted to potentially see if elevated PCO2 was one of those contributing factors. Um, the other is that vaterite is more soluble than aragonite. Um, it's actually one of the most soluble forms of calcium carbonate. Um, and you can think of solubility as, as kind of sensitivity to acidification conditions. And so um, here on the top, we have what I would consider a normal fully aragonitic otolith. This is from day zero, the right side of the fish. And then we have instances of vateritic growth. And so you can kind of see um, it's marked by, I call it this cauliflower structure. Um, here, it's a lot more clear than the opaque aragonite. Um, you'll get growths that kind of envelop most of the otolith. We actually have this is, uh, appears to grow on top of the aragonite too. Um, and then in this one, we actually have like a full spire of aragonite. So this is a 3D structure pointing up at the camera. Um, and so we looked at batterite presence over the course of the experiment. Um, and this figure here is showing you um, timing of the experiment as well as the percent of batterite over the course of the experiment. Um, and we both have left side and right side presented um, and then our treatment conditions. Um, and so another thing that I need to point out is that we had zero instance of batteritic otolith present on day zero. Um, and so none of the otoliths in our day zero samples had any batterite present. Um, and so what we found was that there was no effect of our treatment conditions on the presence of vaterite, but we did see a significant effect of time on the percent of vaterite presence. And so over time, we did have increasing vaterite levels. Another interesting thing we did was compare the presence of vaterite between uh, what we call mortality event fish, so fish that died unexpectedly, uh, and then fish that were sampled uh, on specific time points. And so we were able to compare those two groups uh, based on their same time frame. Um, and what we found was that more fish that died unexpectedly, so fish that were a part of that mortality event group, had significantly more vaterite present than fish that were sampled at the same time point. Um, and so this is really interesting. And we're still kind of working out what vaterite means for hatchery fish and why it seems to be more prevalent in hatchery fish, but having um, some more clues about, about what it means for a fish and, and why it's potentially forming, particularly with that kind of timing inflection, uh, is really valuable. So moving away from otoliths to hormone response, we looked at the endocrine response uh, via cortisol expression. And cortisol is a stress hormone that's expressed in a lot of vertebrates. Um, and it's just a way that the animal can kind of respond to a kind of stressor. Um, and so what we found, we have cortisol here on the uh, y-axis plotted over the course of the experiment. Um, and as you can see, there's a very strong trend of increasing cortisol over time until week three and four uh, when cortisol levels began to decrease. 
Um, and so overall, we saw a significant effect of elevated PCO2 on cortisol expression. So fish that were reared in elevated PCO2 treatments or under acidic conditions um, had an elevated uh, cortisol expression. I also uh, want to point out that um, this three to four week time period was really interesting for us. This kind of steep drop off from pretty intense cortisol expression back down to what we saw early on in the experiment. And if you remember, our timing of mortality happened right between weeks three and four. And so um, we're still kind of piecing together what this means in terms of the story of how pink salmon are responding to these impacts. But one of the really awesome things that using kind of this multiple biological organization study approach allows us to do is use different measurements like cortisol expression to kind of help answer questions about other aspects. And so we can use cortisol expression rates to compare that to vaterite presence at the same time point. And so two things that appear totally potentially not connected might actually help kind of flesh out why we're seeing patterns in other areas of fish response. Um, the final metric I want to show you guys is routine metabolic rate. And so what this is essentially is just a fish existing. So this is another, you know, they're not being stressed. We're not doing any kind of chase treatment. Um, they're just existing when we measure their oxygen consumption. Um, and so what we have here is oxygen consumption uh, over the course of the experiment. So weeks two, four, and six. Um, and what we found was a significant positive effect of elevated PCO2 on routine metabolic rate. Um, so fish that were experiencing that exposure to elevated PCO2 had higher uh, RMRs than fish that were in ambient conditions. We also saw a positive effect of time on R RMR. So individuals in all treatments had significantly higher RMRs on weeks four and six than they did on week two. Um, and so uh, this is just kind of interesting is that it shows us that over time we likely see um, changing uh, metabolic rates as you know fish are growing and developing, but it also does look like we have an effect of that acidic, acidic condition treatment on their routine metabolic rate. So uh, preliminary takeaways, I know I've learned a lot of information in everyone. Um, we found that exposure to elevated PCO2 uh, led to a reduction in conditional index as well as mass. Um, we also saw that the interaction of reduced food availability and ocean acidification altered certain metrics of fish morphological development. Um, overall, this suggests that in the future, we'll see smaller, lower quality fish um, under uh, future ocean conditions. Um, we also potentially saw that there is, uh, we're getting closer to identifying that onset of vateritic otolith growth in hatchery fish, which is really exciting. Um, but we also potentially saw that there's an impact of vaterite on fish mortality. Um, we saw that there was evidence of increased stress response to uh, elevated PCO2 conditions um, via that cortisol expression. Uh, and we also saw an increase in routine metabolic rate under elevated PCO2 conditions. So next we'll be finishing out the otolith uh, characteristic analysis by looking at crystallography. So looking at specific characteristics of both batterite and aragonite formation uh, presence on otoliths, um, as well as doing kind of a methodological comparison between visual analysis and uh, Vermont spectroscopy. And then also doing a gene expression analysis. So looking at some hallmark genes associated with OA stress or metabolic stress um, to kind of flesh out what's happening on an intracellular level. Um, this work was funded by the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, the Alaska Epsmore Fire and Ice Project, the Rasmussen Fisheries Research Center, um, and was conducted at the Lutic Pride Marine Institute in Seward. Um, if you're interested in the project, there is also a video on YouTube, and if you take a picture of this QR code, it will take you to that. Um, and with that, I will take any questions in the breakout session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marina, and thanks to all three of our presenters. That was terrific. Um, a big virtual uh, hand uh, hand for uh, all three um, all three of our presenters. And an apology that we don't have time.
to uh, get into Q&A in the full plenary. I'm sure that there are some questions from everyone, but we're going to allow more people to talk and to get into more detail by dividing the group up. Um, so we'll now move into three smaller groups. You're welcome to put questions in the chat in your breakouts. Now we do, um, Chris, I'll just make a note that we do have a couple of questions for you in particular and some additional information on, um, on information that's available for CRAB. So for those who haven't seen it, there is a there are a couple of items in the chat that might be of interest to you. So as we move into three smaller groups, you're going to have a choice of um, going to the ground fish group, the salmon group, or the crab group. Um, you'll, you can choose by topic area. Each group will have the guest presenter, a note taker, and a facilitator. And for those of you who've participated in prior sessions, we'll have a mural again, but we want to have a uh, make sure that we're doing plenty of back and forth and interaction in the group. So feel free to adjust as you'd like to. You do not have to use the mural the same way we have in the past. We want you to have fun with those. And maybe that'll prompt some more interaction and some enthusiasm from the group. Those of you who don't want to speak out as much and are more comfortable writing, you have an option, but it's set up to be able to encourage some exchange. All of the groups are set up with the same set of questions. These are focusing in particular on what kind of, um, how we use science to inform decision-making for a variety of purposes, and to get some more information from you about what you're observing in ocean conditions. Are there changes that you're seeing that could be attributed to ocean acidification? So um, we also have a question, a little bit exercise for the group that's new, that might give us some feedback about what kind of information you want to get and when. And the implication in this exercise that your facilitators will take you through is focused on trying to sense whether early information that perhaps has um, more uncertainty and, um, and is less able to look further into the future is better versus information that we have complete confidence in, might not be able to project as far out, but is, has a high degree of certainty. We want to gauge how pe people feel about the way that we, when we release um, research and the way that we do that so that it really can add the most value to those who can benefit from it. So we're going to take a little, do a little exercise to kind of gauge your preference on that. So um, look forward to that in your group. So Darcy, I think um, it, we can post the different groups. You'll have the ch chance to join. You'll have to select the group that you want to join, and then we'll bring everyone back just shortly before the top of the hour, about 10 minutes um, to share some uh, highlights from the discussions you had in your small groups. So you can see your choices, they should be in front of you. And 